Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And we will start with listed questions. I call Mr Joe Byrne. Mr Byrne. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number one. I call the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Invest Northern Ireland is currently working on the presentation of jobs promoted at sub-regional level in 2013-14, including West Tyrone. It intends to publish the information once the figures have been fully validated. However, during 2012-13, 678 jobs were promoted by Invest Northern Ireland in West Tyrone. These jobs were promoted in projects undertaken uh, by companies such as Allstate, Telestack, Terex and Terramac Fabrication. Mr Byrne, for supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, I thank the Minister for her answer and for the number of jobs promoted. Can I ask the Minister, in relation to the Terex jobs, uh, when does the Department hope that those jobs will be realised? And given the current constraints in relation to uh, land available for industrial development in Oma, can you give any reassurance about what might happen in that regard? I thank the member uh, for supplementary. In relation to the Terex job, um, I'm hoping that Invest Northern Ireland will be able to give you those figures. I know for sure that some of those jobs have already been created and are in post. Uh, I just don't have the precise figures in relation uh, to the jobs creation. Uh, in relation to uh, Terex's desire to do more in the OMA area, we are certainly working alongside them to try and identify an appropriate site. I am acutely aware of the fact that there is um, a shortage of, of land uh, in uh, Invest and I's site in OMA at present. He will know, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we have been attempting to resolve this issue. We have had uh, a number of attempts to acquire land. Uh, unfortunately, none of them have been successful to date. But again, we'll continue to keep looking for appropriate land, and I'm sure the member would want to work with us uh, to try and assist us in that regard. Call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And as uh, someone who represents a neighbouring constituency in Mid Ulster, um, I know too well the, the benefit that the um, manufacturing industry brings to my constituency. But can the minister outline how she feels that the manufacturing as a whole brings to um, the economy in Northern Ireland? Well, I thank the member for his question. And uh, the uh, whole area of Tyrone has been very significant in terms of what it has achieved uh, for the manufacturing and particularly the engineering uh, sector uh, over this past number of years. There are around 50 significant sized uh, Invest in client companies classified as engineering based in Tyrone uh, alone and the majority of these are within the materials handling sectors. Um, there's also uh, another 25 outside of Tyrone, which just goes to prove that you can have a material handling company outside of Tyrone, although most seem to be uh, placed in Tyrone. And they have proven to be very successful. They had a very tough time at the beginning of the recession. However, they have regrouped. They have come back again, and they are now uh, working in a number of export markets right across the world, and we will continue to work with them to explore new export markets, and that's something I'm very pleased to be able to do when I accompany them on trade missions. Call Mrs. Sandra over in for a question. Question number two, please, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And with your permission, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will answer questions two and ten together. Uh, the Giro d'Italia has delivered a wide range of economic benefits. In particular, it has attracted out-of-state visitors, both tourists and those travelling with the competition, uh, that all spent money in local businesses. The Northern Ireland Tourist Board is currently undertaking the post-event evaluation. However, when final figures are complete, we anticipate overall visitor numbers will exceed the 140,000 target which we set. Hosting these successful international events also gives us significant positive global media exposure and this helps to change perceptions about Northern Ireland as a holiday destination and provides a unique marketing opportunity to grow overseas tourism in the future. Indeed, the key objective for staging the Giro d'Italia was to showcase Northern Ireland on a world stage. Many hundreds of international journalists and photographers joined the cheering visitors and local people, providing a welcome to Northern Ireland that was beyond the organisers' expectations. And I'm told that Northern Ireland has very much set the bar for all future big starts. Call Mrs. Overend for a supplementary. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. In fact, I um, very much welcome uh, the success of the Giro d'Italia. Um, would the Minister uh, the Minister will be aware of the, the latest tourism figures that, that say that uh, the GB visitors are, are up, but yet the Republic of Ireland visitors are down in around 15%. Um, does the Minister have any plans to, uh, to increase and uh, to change tact to improve the visitor numbers coming from the Republic of Ireland and from further afield into Northern Ireland? And uh, also, if, I wonder if the Minister would, would tell the House if... Uh, the numbers for the Giro d'Italia possibly qualify for, um, so that she can set her sights on the Tour de France coming to Northern Ireland. Um, in terms of the uh, recent tourism figures that have been uh, released, I have to say overall the picture is a very healthy one. Um, we are up overall uh, 2% uh, in 2013 and we have to recall that 2012 was a very significant year for us and was very much a year that we brought a lot of visitors to Northern Ireland but I'm pleased that we've still managed to increase our numbers uh, last year. Uh, for some markets, uh, as the member has said, we have had significant growth. Uh, the GB figures have increased by 13%. Uh, but unfortunately, the Republic of Ireland uh, figures have dropped, I think it is, by 7%. Uh, overall, the trend uh, is moving upwards, but clearly there are issues that we need to identify uh, to deal with the drop in ROI figures. The ROI figures had increased significantly uh, in 2012, so we were at a high level, and they have dropped back now, and we need to try and understand why that is the case. In terms of the GB figures, I am, as you would imagine, very, very pleased to see those figures uh, rise. And indeed, overall visitors from outside of Northern Ireland in general increased by 6%. So a good story. There are some bits to improve upon, uh, but I do believe that we can uh, tackle that issue uh, moving forward. Uh, in terms of the Tour de France, uh, as she will know, uh, we have identified a number of large-scale events that we would like to come to Northern Ireland because we believe we have the correct infrastructure now in place and we want to attract more large events like the Giro d'Italia, uh, which can I say, Mr Deputy Speaker, was a tremendous success, a success for so many reasons, and not least the fact that the people of Northern Ireland came out onto the streets dressed in pink and had a joyous weekend. What a tremendous thing it was to be a part of, and I was very pleased uh, to be a part of it. So we will be looking for other large-scale events, and uh, that's something uh, that we hope to make some announcements about uh, in the near future. May I encourage members, please, to be brief in their supplementaries. And with that, I call Mr. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, the Giro d'Italia, as she has said, was a huge success. The UK city of culture was a huge success, and the ability of Northern Ireland to attract those two events indicates that we are punching well above our weight. Could I ask her, though, to comment on the attack, a terrorist attack on the Everglades Hotel, and what the implications of that might be? And can I thank the member for a supplementary, because it does give me the opportunity to outrightly condemn what was going on in Londonderry. While, while I was sitting at the Northern Ireland Tourism Awards and I was watching as the UK City of Culture received the outstanding contribution to tourism, um, at that very same time there were individuals who had decided to put a bomb into the Everglades Hotel. And I think the uh, difference between those two stories about Londonderry, I think, should not be lost on, on anyone. Can I commend the staff at the Everglades Hotel for the excellent work in making sure that everyone uh, was out of the hotel at that particular time? I think uh, their actions were none less than heroic. Of course, it's not the first time uh, that the Hastings family have suffered at the hands of terrorism. Uh, we commend them for the fact that they had the hotel open again uh, on Sunday uh, to welcome uh, the marathon, which I understand was a huge success. And I commend them for their determination not to be pushed aside by those who would seek to push us backwards. Call Mr. Phil Flanagan. I thank the, the Minister for her answers. Um, can the Minister outline to the House what um, plans are in place to make sure that um, in, in the future that we benefit to the maximum of the, the, 
the large number of, of high-profile international events that we're actually hosting here, and there's not just um, a one-off short-term short economic benefit of, of hosting these events, and that it's a long-term gain? Well, uh, I mean, absolutely, and that's what we're engaged in. We're engaged in making sure that we gain a legacy from the events that come uh, to Northern Ireland, and I think we have achieved that to date, and we will achieve it with the Giro d'Italia as well, because what we're planning to do uh, with their support and help is to host the Grand Fondo, uh, which is uh, the legacy event from the Giro d'Italia, which will see uh, a race coming, a more of a family oriented race coming to Northern Ireland, to different areas of Northern Ireland for the next few years. And we're working with the Giro to make sure that that happens. And of course, the legacy in and around the Giro as well has been that a lot of people who never thought about engaging in cycling have actually engaged in cycling. And I'm sure my colleague the DRD Minister will want to look at what legacy he can put in place in relation to that as well. Call Mr Fergal McKinney. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister, and I thank her for her comments thus far, would the Minister care to reflect on the damage uh, that the First Minister's recent comments may be causing on her otherwise good work in terms of attracting inward investment, overseas sales and tourism? Well, I thank the member uh, for his question. Of course, the First Minister has reflected on the comments that have been made and has made his position very clear. Uh, and therefore, I move on. And indeed, I have to say, uh, I haven't any intelligence to show. I haven't any intelligence to show that it has had any damage uh, to Northern Ireland in terms of its tourism uh, interest or indeed in terms of international investment and in particular our work uh, to look to markets outside of Europe in terms of an, our international exports and that's what I continue to do on a day and daily basis. Call Mr Kieran McCarthy. Thank, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On the same uh, train, I welcome the Minister's endorsement of the uh, Giro d'Italia, uh, but would the Minister um, advise people that are in the public domain um, of their, whilst we all agree with free speech entirely, that they should be very mindful of what they say and where that travels and how it can affect Northern Ireland as a tourist potential? Thank you. Order, order. I honestly believe that this supplementary question is well off the mark, but I leave it to the Minister to decide. Well, can I say, I hope that everybody in this House will do their best to promote Northern Ireland, regardless of where they go in the world, and that's certainly something that the First Minister engages in, and it's certainly something that I engage in as well. Call Mr Mickey Brady for a question. Chair Severo, three, question three. Again, with your permission, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will answer questions three and nine together. Electricity prices are determined by the market subject to regulation. The principal requirement is that prices should be cost reflective and apportioned fairly according to consumption. Measures to reduce prices for one customer group will mean that others pay higher prices. That said, my aim is that prices for all consumers should be no higher than necessary to secure our future electricity supplies. Achieving this aim includes east-west and north-south engagement to redesign the single electricity market to meet European market integration requirements, working with the utility regulator to examine how network and related charges are currently allocated across customer groups and the impact of reshaping cost allocations, and reviewing the costs and benefits of Northern Ireland's 40% renewable target. This is in addition to the measures I have taken to promote competition, support innovation, implement a framework for energy efficiency, and develop our infrastructure through gas extension and electricity interconnection. Call Mr. Brady for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Could I ask the Minister to give her assessment of the process of netting which some energy companies are using to give price beating quotes? I'm not sure that that applies in Northern Ireland because, of course, the Northern Ireland market uh, is regulated in a way that the Great Britain market is not regulated. But if the member wants to give me the specifics, I'm quite happy to follow up with him. Call Mr Stephen Mutry. The Minister referred in her answer to work that the, will be undertaken by the utility regulator moving forward. Can she outline what the time scale is for the completion of this work and subsequently how long it will be? for the department to make the required changes? Well, indeed, I had asked the utility regulator's uh, office to carry out a piece of work uh, in relation to the high costs 
uh, associated with our industrial companies, the fact that they uh, are paying high energy prices. I, I am told uh, that the consultancy work uh, that the regulator has engaged uh, will be completed shortly. I hope it will be very shortly because, to be honest, I had hoped it would have been completed by now. Um, I am told that the regulator's office aims to publish uh, by the end of June, start of July, and then a report um, will come to me which will include the results of the analysis uh, undertaken. I, of course, will consider the report uh, to see whether I need to make any policy interventions. But again, we are then talking about uh, who uh, uh, in the energy framework is going to bear the cost. And that is a, a discussion I hope this House is ready to have because it will be a difficult discussion, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, because we're talking about the high cost of energy uh, for industry. But as I've said in my substantive answer, uh, someone has to pay for the changes uh, and we need to discuss who is it going to be. Call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, can I thank the Minister for excuse me, her answers uh, thus far? Can I ask her, has her department done any work on the, the, the impact of the increased production from renewable sources uh, on energy prices? Yes, uh, as I said in my substantive answer, it's one of the areas I, I'm looking at in terms of the cost uh, moving forward. As you know, we've set a, a 40% renewable energy target and I think we need to understand what the costs are that are associated with that and that will form part of the work that I uh, will carry forward and of course the committee will very much want to be involved uh, with that as well. I'm not preempting uh, what that will bring forward but I think it's only right that we should look at that as well. Call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what work her department is doing to support businesses improving their energy efficiency? Well, we do a lot of work uh, in this area, uh, not least in conjunction with the Carbon Trust, uh, who have in the past provided loans for zero percent loans to businesses who want to install uh, energy efficient mechanisms. Uh, and indeed, we continue uh, to intervene with the companies to try and identify for them where they can make uh, savings, not only in terms of cost, but in terms of other efficiencies as well, uh, not least environmental efficiencies. So yes, we do work very closely with firms in that regard, because we do realise what a difference it can make to their bottom line on occasions. Call Mr Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. As a follow-on to Mr Eastwood's question, can the Minister advise if there has been any impact so far either on a positive or negative aspect of, of electricity prices from renewable energy sources? Well, of course, um, there could be a number of answers to that question because he, like I, and like everyone else in this House, will have had representations from individuals who have perhaps received planning permissions for anaerobic digesters or whatever, and then have great difficulties in getting them connected to the grid. So that could be seen uh, as a cost. Um, but also in terms of the prices, uh, he will know that we have renewable obligation certificates. And those, of course, are spread not just against the costs to consumers in Northern Ireland, but right across the United Kingdom. And that's the advantage of being part of the United Kingdom, because we are able to spread those costs right across consumers. So I want to see what the precise costs are. Um, as I said, we will have that work carried out for us, and then I'm sure we'll be able to share it with the rest of the members. Call Mr Pat Ramsey for a question. Question for Deputy Speaker. With regard to the UK City of Culture, I'm sure that it will have created a new confidence uh, that will be reflected in future economic successes, both in increased investment and in a larger number of tourists. Invest Northern Ireland has a regional office in Londonderry and businesses in the FOIL constituency can call upon the same levels of financial and other assistance as any other part of Northern Ireland. Through the Jobs Fund, for example, as of December 2013, the most recent figures available, Invest Northern Ireland has promoted a total of 562 jobs within FOIL, of which 454 have actually been created. Invest NI has also recently offered support of over £2,600,000 to nine companies in FOIL through the loan fund. I can assure you that Invest NI is committed to bringing jobs to all of Northern Ireland, including the FOIL constituency and the surrounding areas. 
I was pleased to announce on the 17th of April of this year Converge's decision to undertake a £10,100,000 investment in Londonderry, promoting 333 jobs, which InvestNI has supported with £1,400,000 of funding. Well, Mr. Ramsey for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her response and for her continued efforts in creating a, a good environment for employment within my constituency. And clearly, in the announcement today on the City of Culture legacy in terms of MTV coming to the City in September is good. And there's absolutely no doubt it has created a magnificent environment around the City. But unfortunately, the NISRA figures of November of last year would indicate that unemployment levels have went up in the City. Could the Minister outline to the House? Uh, who will now have the key role in terms of legacy of the city of culture going forward, particularly when we consider the legacy has to be a true one in terms of employment opportunities? Well, I think um, for me it will be a shared responsibility across the executive because, of course, he knows that uh, Minister Farry and myself are looking at the economic uh, inactivity piece and he has engaged with me in respect of that. Uh, I will continue to work with Invest Northern Ireland to bring uh, more jobs uh, to Londonderry and also to encourage companies that are already there to expand. Uh, in relation to the culture and the arts part of the legacy, of course, that will be taken forward by the decal minister. And therefore, it is a responsibility that we share across the executive. And I suppose, from his perspective, the one plan uh, is very much something that sits at the executive and not just with one department. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I was delighted to hear the Minister uh, criticise those who bombed uh, uh, in Londonderry at the weekend. It's always good to, and appropriate to remind people that they failed in the past and now they're failing again, however reprehensible their activities are. But in terms of job creation following the UK City of Culture uh, and the success of it, can the Minister outline as a Fermanagh-based MLA the importance of jobs being created right across Northern Ireland, particularly in the North West? And uh, again, I take the opportunity to say that those who engage in terrorism, either in the past or, or now or indeed in the future, will not succeed because there is a determination uh, among not just the business community but the wider community that they will not succeed. Uh, in terms of jobs uh, for the North West, we continue, as I said, to work with uh, foreign direct investors, some of whom choose to come to the city, and he will know that Fujitsu announced 177 uh, new jobs earlier this year, and as I've said, Convergys have brought over 330 new jobs. Uh, but as well as that, some of the companies that are already here, all state, of course, a very significant uh, employer in the North West, not only in Londonderry but in Straban as well, 200 new jobs, and then some of our local companies, Fleming Agri Products, All Pipe Engineering, companies like that creating tens and twenties of jobs which are very important to the local economy. So we will continue to work with those companies to try and create jobs uh, in the North West, in the South West, and right across Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister has referred to the amount of great investment in the London area as a city of culture and the new jobs created. Can she also share with us the number of new business start-ups there have been which could be directly attributed to that investment? Um, I can't give him the figures for directly related to the UK City of Culture because, of course, you can't make the direct uh, link. Uh, but in terms of uh, business starts, um, 262 individuals resident in neighbourhood renewal areas in FOIL have set up their own businesses. I think that's probably one of the highest figures uh, in terms of neighbourhood renewals. Um, and they've been able to avail of the Business Start grant. And 38 young people aged between 16 to 24, not in education, employment or training, have set up their own businesses, again, under the NEAT Business Start grant. Uh, those elements were added in, as you may recall, uh, by myself and Invest Northern Ireland at the time of the recession. So we tried to uh, encourage people to start their own business. So I'm very uh, pleased with those figures uh, as well. <coughs> Call Mr. Roy Beggs for a question. Question number five. <clears throat> Going for growth set ambitious targets and challenges for both government and industry, and we face the equally challenging task of balancing financing all of the actions with the competing demands on budgets. 
My department has, however, taken forward all of the recommendations that fall under its remit. Invest Northern Ireland continues to support companies in the agri-food sector, with a record number of agri-food projects in the pipeline, and I look forward to making some important announcements uh, in the near future. I launched the Agri-Food Loan Scheme, which is now open for business. It is anticipated that work uh, to provide new gas networks to the West will begin in 2015. And significant progress has also been made uh, on finding solutions for the sustainable use of poultry litter. My department is also carrying out a comprehensive assessment of marketing and promotion in the agri-food industry and a major review of red tape. Well, Mr. Beggs for supplement. I thank the Minister for, for her answer. Going for growth is vital to both local producers and processors in terms of increasing our exports. But in terms of the Minister's answer, in her previous answer she said she had linked it to welfare reform. Is she now saying that it isn't actually linked to welfare reform and going back on what she said previously? What I said was that, and I quote my question which I've just given uh, to the member, we face the equally challenging task of balancing financing all of the actions with the competing demands on budgets. I rest my case. Call Mr. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Farmers across Northern Ireland are increasingly angry at the appalling way in which the whole issue of cap reform has been uh, handled by the Agriculture Minister. Could the Minister outline what she believes to be the impact of the preference which has been expressed so far for single farm payments to be based on land held rather than production. What impact is that, that likely to have on her going for growth strategy and what discussions has she had with the Agriculture Minister to uh, outline those concerns? I thank the member for his question because anyone who was on the doors at election time knows that this is a massive issue. And there is not much point uh, in talking about going for growth if we can't get cap reform uh, sorted. I am disappointed that we haven't had a paper uh, from the Dard Minister in relation uh, to this issue. Uh, we do need to see an early resolution in relation to cap reform. And in particular, I am very concerned, and I've had a number of phone calls over the weekend, uh, about the future of our red meat sector. Uh, beef prices have fallen week on week. Uh, and we're in real danger of the suckler industry uh, disappearing uh, rather than growing. Of course, going for growth looked at growing uh, the industry, and we do need to have that link uh, between uh, production uh, and payment. So all of this is going to have uh, a long-term impact on our farming industry, uh, but I am particularly worried, Mr Deputy Speaker, in relation to the red meat sector at present, because there are those in distress in that sector, and we need to look to see how we can assist them. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Just to follow on with that, uh, glad to hear the minister express concern at the negative impact there is going to be on the productive sector if we resort to, for example, the default position on single farm payment. Is it, in fact, so serious that not only would it grossly undermine the productive sector in agriculture, but it would emphatically and strategically undermine the very ethos and ideas that lie behind going for growth. Well, I'd like to shock the House by agreeing with everything that Mr Alistair has said, uh, because this is a very fundamental issue. And if we are to get into the position, the, de the default position, then we go to a flat rate immediately and we end up with farmers going out of business. And all of the banks, I have to say, have indicated that that would be absolutely the wrong thing to do for the industry here in Northern Ireland. So I do not see why we are having any further delay on this issue. Uh, I think we should get to deal with this very, very quickly, indeed as a matter of some urgency, and uh, we look to try and have the slowest rate possible in terms of transition that we can possibly have. Well, Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her answers thus far. Minister, bearing in mind the, the, the potential of going for growth and um, realise we need to develop local markets as well as global markets, and also mindful that the Irish Republic is both a competitor as well as a, uh, is, is also a competitor, what discussions have you had with the Irish Government in terms of the implementation of our agri food strategy? 
Well, I think Minister, we would need you'll to get... have to be brief in your answer. I, I think we would need to get agreement uh, at our own executive table in terms of going for growth uh, before we reach out to other um, parts of the island to see what they are involved in. But certainly, for my part, I have implemented all that I can in terms of going for growth, and I ask others to do the same. Our time is up, and we must move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> Not so simple. I correct myself. We must move on to topical questions, and I'm sure the minister will be delighted that the first one is from Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And, uh, Minister, we uh, all noted last week the visit of the Turkish ambassador, and also there was the appointment of a Turkish consul. But how are matters proceeding with a direct flight to Turkey, and what markets could that be opening up for us in the future? I thank the member for his question. I, too, was delighted to meet with the Turkish ambassador and, indeed, our newly appointed consul general. And can I take the opportunity to congratulate the newly appointed consul general, Mr. David Campbell, and wish him well in all that he does here for Turkish citizens that are here, uh, but also in helping us to uh, achieve uh, an air route to Istanbul. Uh, we had discussions about that uh, when the Turkish ambassador was here, and we will continue to have those discussions because I think it is a real uh, probability. Uh, and can I also say not only would it open up Turkey for us, but of course would open up routes into the rest of the Middle East as well, because Istanbul is very much a, a hub airport, and indeed I have used it on a number of occasions uh, when I've been uh, to the Middle East on trade missions. Well, Mr. Kinnahan for supplementary. Thank you very much. May I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, I wondered what actions her department has been taken to help try and get more flights and more work going through our own airports here in the north so that we compete with Dublin and can expand here, but at the same time without the two airports competing against each other. Well, I thank the member. Uh, indeed, we have been conducting, in conjunction with the Department of Finance and Personnel, an air connectivity study. Uh, the first phase of that has been complete, uh, and now we are completing the second phase, which includes engaging uh, with potential airlines and, of course, uh, our uh, airports as well to see what we can achieve. But it really is about showing them that there is a market here uh, to tap into, uh, not just in Northern Ireland, but as I have argued as well, into the border counties uh, of the Republic of Ireland, who could travel from Northern Ireland to further afield. Uh, and that's the argument I will be putting up, not only uh, with Turkish Airlines, but indeed uh, another uh, number of airlines who I'll be meeting in the near future as well. Call Ms. Rosalie McCarley for a question. Good, um, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and uh, I thank the Minister for her, for her answers. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, has she or her department or uh, Invest and I had any discussions uh, in relation to the Glen 10 Development Master Plan in West Belfast? Good. Yes, as I understand it, Invest and I have been uh, involved uh, with the discussions in relation to that issue. I don't obviously have uh, the details here. But of course, we are again always pleased to see local communities bringing forward uh, positive plans for their communities, and we will always interact where we can to make a difference to those plans, as we have done right across Northern Ireland. Ms. McCarley for supplementary. Uh, I appreciate that the, the Minister do, doesn't have the detail of it, but I was just wondering, would she agree that it would be important that jobs would arise out, out of this development, given the, the, um, the high levels of unemployment and youth unemployment in West Belfast? Well, indeed, and I hope that that very much is the case. It is about forming a proposition uh, that will attract jobs to uh, that particular area and also encourage uh, those local employers to look for more jobs and to expand. Uh, in that regard, I was very pleased to be in West Belfast back in March uh, with Delta Print and Packaging to announce 100 new jobs there, 100 new jobs for uh, uh, the area and very good jobs as well. And, of course, we know that uh, Caterpillar uh, also have put 200 new jobs in there just last year. So we will continue to work uh, with the representatives of West Belfast as we do with all of the other constituencies. Call Mr Alex Atwood for a topical question. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the uh, Minister uh, if this afternoon uh, she can confirm if she will or will not follow the example this morning of her ministerial colleague in the Department of the Environment who announced that he was relocating or he identified 50 jobs that would be moving to the Coleraine DVA accommodation in an attempt to mitigate the bad decision that was made by London in closing that particular facility. And of course, I join with him uh, in saying that it was a bad decision and a decision uh, that he and indeed I uh, lobbied on uh, to try and stop, uh, in not only in this job but in my previous uh, role as Minister uh, of the Environment back in 2007. Uh, the, I do congratulate the Minister of Environment for what he has announced this morning. I think it will make a, a difference uh, in the coal rain and as I understand it, Londonderry uh, is to benefit uh, as well from uh, his announcement. We certainly will be looking uh, as a department to the opportunities that uh, RPA provides to us uh, particularly, and bearing in mind the plea that has been made uh, by the coal rain area in particular, um, and uh, we will be looking to see if there are anything, is there anything we can do in terms of Invest NI, uh, in terms of the tourist board. I think he will recognise with me that I'm not a huge employer uh, in my department, unlike, I have to say, other ministers who are, uh, but certainly we will be looking at it in that context. Call Mr. Atwood for supplementary. Minister for chiding her ministerial colleagues who thus far have not measured up to the standard and leadership shown by Minister Durkin this morning. It, it so happens, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that there's over a thousand jobs in Detty and Invest Northern Ireland. A thousand jobs. Can the minister confirm is she going to identify 50 of those to relocate to the Coleraine accommodation? The request that was being made by members of the trade unions in front of this building only two hours ago. And I recognise that the Minister wants to make a political point and to grab the headlines, so be it. Um, oh, sorry, former Minister, <laughs> former minister uh, wants to do that. Uh, but I, I have a duty to my employees and I have a duty to look at it in a strategic way, and that is how I will do it in the context of RPA. And that's why uh, I made the answer that I did in the first state. Call Mr. Sean Lynch for a topical question. Can I ask the Minister how her department proposes to deal with the income crisis in what poverty is continued to rise and how she hopes to deal with it? Well, in terms of low wages, and I presume that that is what the member is referring to, I am very pleased to tell him that 40 per cent of the jobs that we have brought into uh, Northern Ireland have been above the private sector median and with higher wages that drives the economy forward and indeed tries to close that productivity gap uh, and of course that is what uh, we were determined to do before the recession took hold. Then when the recession took hold we had to recalibrate and look about creating jobs uh, of any nature but now we are very determinedly moving forward to make sure that we create higher value jobs and therefore drive the economy forward. Mr. Lynch for supplementary. Gorm Gregor, uh, I want to thank the Minister for answer. And the Minister did cover in the question time about uh, energy costs. Um, however, what is required is a strategy to address both living costs and, um, and energy costs. Will the Minister assure us that she can have a strategy to deal with both? Well, uh, at the risk of trying to take over some of my others' uh, departmental responsibilities. I will work with the Department of Social Development and the Department of Employment and Learning and indeed the Department of Health in terms of their uh, remit as well to try and deal with the issues which the member has raised. Call Mr Alex Maskey for a topical question. Cormaghi, last call. Corley, can I ask the Minister, could you give us her, her assessment of the recent labour market statistics? Well, I was pleased for the 15th month in a row uh, that we continued to move in the right direction. Uh, 800 people came off the uh, unemployment uh, register, which of course is good news. That doesn't mean that we still don't have a challenge in front of us. We do, of course. Uh, the statistics are in and around 7.2% uh, at present uh, of the working population, and I believe we are moving in the right direction. 
Mr. Maskey for supplementary. Mr. Lawson, could I could thank the minister for that response, and uh, could I welcome obviously all of the positive aspects of the statistics and within the report. But could I ask the minister? Would you also agree that uh, many would say that our local economy is dominated, if you like, by low-pay jobs, uh, by underemployment levels, and also this, this spectrum, unfortunately, it's not just peculiar to here, but of immigration? And that is why, when I answered uh, your colleague, I said that we needed to drive more higher-level jobs into Northern Ireland so that people who are underemployed are able to find jobs to fit their qualifications. Uh, that's very much our strategy at present. Uh, I believe we are moving in the right direction in that regard, and with the help of colleagues, we will continue to do so. Call Lord Morrow for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what emphasis and how valuable does she assess the creation of enterprise zones in Northern Ireland? Well, as a member will know, very recently uh, Coleraine has been awarded uh, the designation of an enterprise zone in a very specific area uh, close to the University of Ulster. Uh, it has been uh, achieved uh, after a request went forward from the executive to the Chancellor. The Chancellor has designated that area as an enterprise zone. It is a very particular uh, and peculiar uh, 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 zone because it means that we would be able to apply capital allowances to that specific area and that specific area alone, and that really is the benefit, uh, particularly for high intensive cap for capitally intensive um, organisations like data centres where they have to put in a, a lot of equipment. Lord Morrow for a supplementary. Well, I thank the minister for her very uh, comprehensive answer, and I welcome it. But would the minister? consider an enterprise zone for the Dungannon South Tyrone area, in particular one in the Ballygolly area, which due to its critical strategic location. And I thank the member for his question. And uh, indeed, uh, Ballygolly, with its road links, is now uh, a very, in a very, very good location in terms of, of investment. And I certainly will look at the area to see if there are opportunities uh, initially for Invest Northern Ireland to purchase land in the area, uh, because I understand that the park at Dungannon is going very well, uh, and indeed uh, that there may well be a shortage in the near future in terms of land in the Dungannon and South Tyrone area. Well, Mr. Mickey Brady, for a topical question. Why well, I got uh, last concordia. Can I ask the minister for an update on the rollout of additional? Broadband, a rural broadband provision in Uri Armagh? Well, not just in Uri and Armagh, uh, but right across Northern Ireland. Uh, BT have been awarded the uh, NI Broadband Improvement Project. Uh, they signed uh, the contract for that on the 4th of February. And they've commenced an extensive survey and design process that will take a number of months to complete because it may be that instead of putting new infrastructure into an area, they may just need to redesign uh, the infrastructure that's available. Uh, but and until that process is complete, it's not going to be possible to be precise as to which premises are likely to benefit. But uh, safe to say the project will bring um, increased and better broadband speeds to over 45,000 premises by the end of 2015. Mr. Brady, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. And could I ask the Minister, is it still the Executive's intention to ensure that every household has access to 2 meg broadband uh, by 2015 in line with the uh, programme for government commitment? Of course, uh, it is our intention to move towards the programme for government commitment. Uh, it wouldn't be there if we didn't want to uh, make sure that we delivered upon it. He will know that as we get closer to getting to that 100% uh, coverage, it gets more and more difficult. Uh, however, we do hope that we can do that with this new contract that has been awarded to BT. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister to comment on the Invest in a uh, end of year performance? Well, yes, the end of year performance, and I'm surprised more people didn't uh, recognise it today, but there you go. Good news doesn't always get to the floor of this House. Uh, almost 11,000 new promoted uh, jobs against a target of 7,780. Uh, 6,040 of those in locally owned companies uh, supported wages and salaries of £190 million, pounds, with 45 per cent generated by local businesses, and secured £239 million pounds of R&D uh, 
business investment. I think these are tremendous statistics. I commend the Chief Executive and all of Invest Northern Ireland for the very hard work that they do. Mr. Anderson, for supplementary. Thank you for that response and for that tremendous uh, report. Uh, but uh, does the Minister believe that this performance can continue and be repeated in the current financial year? Well, I very much hope so, and we'll be setting targets uh, in that regard. Um, I, I do have to say that we are at record levels in terms of uh, the offers of support that Invest and I have made to businesses right across Northern Ireland, the highest number ever made uh, in one year. I think that's a tremendous uh, thing to be able to stand here and say. Uh, but we will, of course, continue uh, to work with businesses to try and make sure that we can continue on an upward trajectory. Order. Time is up.